morning, friends. This is Pastor David Packer from International Baptist Church in Stuttgart, Germany. I'm here in the church building this time. You can see the seats behind me. Uh, we're able to start meeting again, and so many of our members are coming back to meet. We have to maintain social distance, so our auditorium that is made to seat several hundred people, we have to limit it only to about 125 people. Uh, but we have two services, 9.30 and 11.30. But many are still preferring to see these videos, so I'm continuing to record these. Today, we're, we're looking at the church in Pergamum, uh, and it's in your Bible in Revelation 2. While you're finding that text, let me say a big, huge thank you to Jeremy Fairbrass. Jeremy has been tireless and, and very helpful in putting together these videos. Uh, he's the one that puts in the title and the scripture and everything. And I just want, if you know Jeremy, say thank you to him. He would appreciate it. But we deeply appreciate all the work he has done so that we can record these messages for you. And I pray that God would bless you uh, in this uh, through this message. Now, we mentioned the last two weeks, we are in the seven letters to seven churches in chapters two and three of Revelation. Uh, it's seven churches. This is symbolic of all the churches during the church age. And each of these churches were real churches, uh, but they are dealing with specific issues that every church uh, in every age is, is, is tempted to deal with or, or is drawn into this, these issues. Uh, the Church at Ephesus, the first one we looked at uh, was the loveless church. They were doctrinally pure, but they lost their love for Christ. Uh, last week, we looked at the persecuted church, uh, the church at Smyrna. Uh, they were the church that had endured persecution. And uh, and there, nothing negative was said about that church. They were the long-suffering church. But today, we're looking at the liberal church of Pergamum. Uh, the title of the sermon is Christian Faith in a Liberal Age. And the liberal age in which we live both corrupts our faith in the Word of God, our dependence on it, or it compromises us doctrinally in our teachings and our beliefs, but also compromises us morally. Next week, when we look at the church at Thuatira, we'll talk about how you pronounce that next week. But when we look at that church, then we're going to look more in the issue of moral compromise. Uh, but today we're looking at Pergamum. Now, the passage starts this way in Revelation 2.12. It says this, And to the angel of the church at Pergamum write, These things say he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Of course, that's a reference to the Word of God. And that's how Christ introduces himself. So we know this section is really about the moral compromise of the church. Uh, well, um, excuse me, the doctrinal compromise of the church. Uh, Pergamum represents the doctrinally compromised church. It is the church that's mixed the world's ideas with the Word of God. And any time we mix, the, mix God's truths with the standards or the ideas uh, of the world, it, it is the truth that will suffer. The truth will suffer. Um, there's a twofold command to all Christians uh, to uphold the Word of God, and also to not de not add to it. So we uphold it, but we do not add to it. We should not go beyond that which was written. Let me give you a, a couple of passages. First of all, Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6 says, Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. And then in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6, it says this, Do not go beyond what is written. So we do not detract from the Word of God. We do not add to the Word of God. Rather, we take it as it is, as God's message to us. Historically, uh, these churches can be seen as representing different stages or different eras of church history. And if we, we see it that way, then uh, the church at Pergamum uh, represents uh, this, this era from about 313 A.D. to 600 A.D. Uh, and this is the time after Constantine legalized Christianity. The church at Smyrna uh, was a, a, a symbolic of the period leading up to 313 when the Roman uh, government, it's several times, 10 different times, there were imperial edicts to persecute the church. So uh, the Roman Empire was uh, opposed to Christianity until Constantine, the first Christian emperor, and he legalized it later on 
uh, it was made to be the state church. We'll talk about that also. Uh, but it, it represents uh, the the problem of compromising the truth. You know, we we weep for the church at Smyrna. We weep for the church that endured persecution for uh, some uh, three, almost three centuries, and uh, the pain that they went through, and all of the issues related to that. It, it's uh, it breaks your heart to read the stories of martyrdom and of persecution, and even to this day, the church experiences persecution around the world, and it does break your heart. Well, when we get to this era of the Pergamum era, uh, it uh, we are we are encouraged that at least the church is no longer no longer experiencing persecution. It's legal. It's okay to be a Christian. Uh, but our heart breaks afresh because of what type of Christians they became. Uh, several things began to be mixed in the Christian faith during this era. For example, as the church spread, pagan temples became Christian churches. Well, that wasn't necessarily bad. I mean, church buildings, pagan temples be used for Christians. That sounds good. But the problem was this, often pagan rites, R-I-T-E-S, uh, and ceremonies became adopted by Christianity. For example, a pagan midwinter solstice celebration became Christmas. The Bible doesn't tell us uh, when Jesus was born, but we have an idea. It probably wasn't in at the end of December, the way we, we celebrate Christmas. Uh, and, uh, and they was adopted into the church. Well, let me say a word about this, that um, that's not necessarily a bad thing to do, to take a pagan celebration and Christianize it uh, and to bring it into the the faith because people were used to celebrating something at that time. And many times missionaries have done this. They found things that were they were important uh, to the culture, and they came and evangelized the people, and they knew they needed to do something, or the people, when these seasons and these uh, these holidays came around, sometimes unholy days came around, that the people be drawn back to an old faith. So they created something. That's not a bad thing to do, and so Christmas is not necessarily a, an evil thing, but it serves as a symbol of how the pure doctrine of the New Testament can be mixed with pagan and unchristian ideas. So uh, this is one of the problems that the churches began to meet in pagan temples or formerly pagan temples, and they became a bit pagan themselves. Uh, children began to be christened at birth. In the New Testament, we see nothing about that. Everyone in the New Testament who was baptized believed first, and then they were baptized. But then they began to not baptized uh, by immersion, but began to christen or to, usually it was by immersion also they would do it, but still it was something done for children at birth, not following faith, but before faith. The Eucharist or the Lord's Supper or communion meal, it began to replace the sermon. Uh, previously, people heard the gospel preached and they put their faith and trust in Christ, uh, but then they began to use the Eucharist or began to use the Lord's Supper. And, and in the second thing is the priest replaced the pastor teacher. The pastor teacher is a position mentioned in Ephesians 4.11, but the, but the pagan priest began to replace the Christian pastor. So uh, you had, rather than the gospel, you had the Eucharist. Rather than the pastor who was a teacher, you had the priest who organized a ceremony. In some places, uh, pagan priests, formerly pagan priests, became Christians and became priests or became uh, pastors. But quite often, uh, someone who ran a pagan temple, because it was legal then to be a, a Christian and sometimes even illegal to be a pagan, they just came into the church uh, and with un, not being converted. And so the church began to be tempted with power and prestige. They began to be to go after that lust of respectability rather than seeking to please God. And the church became very perverted, very perverted. Well, this is the, the Pergamum era, uh, and uh, this is what goes on in our lives today. It is tough, it is tough in today's world to be a biblical Christian. So we're looking at three things. First of all, how Christ introduces himself. Secondly, what does he say about the church? How does he evaluate or assess the church? And thirdly, what is, uh, how can we become overcomers in our faith? First of all, how Christ identified himself. We already read the scripture. He said, I am the one who holds the sharp two-edged sword. Uh, and that's a reference to the word of God. 
Now, by two edges, we could say it, it cuts both ways. The, the Word of God brings conviction of our sin, but also brings assurance of our salvation. It is bad news that we are sinners and, and, and we, are, we are under the judgment of God and will face separation from God for all eternity in hell without faith in Him, without salvation. Uh, but it cuts the other way that when we trust in Him through the Word, we are assured of our salvation, we are comforted, uh, we are given the, the grace gifts of the Spirit, and, and God blesses us. And all these things we learn through the Word of God. Uh, but uh, it's important to realize how essential the Word of God is to the church. Uh, this is nothing that is just uh, something we've added on or we can throw out. Rather, Christ identified himself as the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. Uh, and that's his word. Uh, that's who our Lord is. Our Lord is the one who inspired the word of God. Now, what is the Bible? Now, we identify the Bible as the Old and New Testament, today's world. That's been well established. But where did it come from? Well, let me just give you a few passages that's helpful to look at. If you have a Bible, you may want to flip back in some of these passages. But let's look here in, in John chapter 5, uh, verse 39. He said this. Jesus said, you diligently search the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. So Christ said there is a Christ-centered unity in the Old Testament. He was speaking about the Old Testament because the New Testament had not been written yet. But the Old Testament points to Christ. If you look in at the end of Luke's gospel, you see Jesus teaching the disciples about his word, about what they were to, to expect. And, and when the apostles initially went out, they used the Old Testament. And Jesus explained what parts of the Old Testament or part, part of the writings would be used. In verse 44, this is Luke 24, verse 44, he said this, This is what I told you when I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Now, we organize our, our Old Testament differently today, but that was the organization of the Old Testament for the Jewish community. Three parts, uh, the, the, the first five books, and then there was the prophets, and then the, the Psalms was the first book into the third section, often called the writings also. But he's basically describing our Old Testament. He says this is the, is the scripture that's inspired of God. It's going to testify about me. Well, what about the New Testament? How did that come about? How did we get the New Testament? Well, the New Testament came through the apostles' teaching. That was what the apostles did. They they taught the Word of God, and the early church listened to the apostles, and they wanted to know what the apostles taught. And the New Testament books that we have in our Bible, 27 books in the New Testament, we understand these really as representing the teachings of the apostles. Now, how did that work out? Well, actually, it worked out very informally, but by the Holy Spirit's conviction to the early church. It was centuries later before they made a specific list. Leading up in the early, early, early Christian centuries, or through those early centuries, we find that different church fathers made listing of some of these books, we call them, or letters of the Gospels. Uh, and some they rejected as not being really inspired of God, or even some even uh, falsely attributed to an apostle. Uh, but the church began to be convicted by the Spirit as what was the Word of God. And so the New Testament we have today is that list of books that the early church said, this is the Word of God that's been handed down and meticulously copied. Now, it's important the church maintain its commitment to the Word of God because that's where the power of Christ comes in our life. This is what Jesus said in, in John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. He said this, if you hold to my teaching, Notice that if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. We can't be a disciple of Christ without holding to his teaching. And that word Christian comes from Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ of God, the Messiah of God. So it says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It's the truth about Jesus and the word of God that sets us free from enslavement to sin. 
Well, this is the sharp two-edged sword that comes out of his mouth that speaks with authority, convicting us of sin, uh, convincing us of grace and assuring us of our salvation, building us up spiritually, freeing us, freeing us from a life of sin. Uh, a Christian should spend time in the Word of God every day. It brings us to light. But yet many times the church has turned away from the Word of God, or sometimes Christians have turned away from the Word of God. There are two ways this is done. Sometimes it's done overtly by simply saying, we don't believe this section, and and just shutting our hearts and our minds to it. But often it's done uh, privately and secretly uh, by simply not going to the Word. Often people say, oh, we believe the Word of God, we just don't read it, you know. <laughs> we believe it, we're just not uh, into reading it and taking time. Old pastor, here's my uh, my Bible. This is my Bible I had for years. I've preached in it for years. You can see how marked up it is. Uh, and the pages are fairly dirty along in the side. That's because I've had my finger in it so many d different times through the years. An old pastor said, uh, you know, you see a dirty Bible, you're going to find a clean Christian. But you see, a clean Bible, probably you're going to find a dirty Christian. So take your Bible, mark it up, memorize Scripture, uh, make it precious to you. This is God's message to you. This is the word of Christ. Liberate you and free you from enslavement to sin and bring you into a new and wonderful life in the spirit, the freedom of the spirit and the freedom of the word of God. Now, the second thing, how Christ uh, is evaluated or assessed the church. Here's what he says. He says this. He says, verse 13, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Now, let me sum that up very quickly. Simply to say that he says, I know you're living in a difficult place. I know uh, you have hold, held on to my name. You have identified uh, with me, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ of God, and you are living in a difficult place. Well, it's good to remember this, that God knows where we are and, and he is going to judge us and evaluate us uh, with that knowledge. He's going to consider that Christian who has faced very difficult trials because of the place he has lived, because what he has personally endured. He's going to evaluate that Christian much differently than he would someone who's had every break in the book, who's had every spiritual break in the book. God is a just judge, and he is also going to give us the help we need. So he commends the church. He says, I know you're in a difficult place. But here's what he says in verse 14. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Just because we're in a difficult place does not excuse our sin. We still have an obligation, even in difficult places, uh, to live the truth and to believe the truth. He said, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you have those who hold to the teaching of the Lycanlaetans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now notice the weapon that he says will bring victory is the, the word of God. That's the sword of his mouth. But let's break this down a little bit. What's he referring to? Uh, first of all, uh, he, he says that Satan is set up there powerfully where they are, and he is going to oppose them. He is going to try and trick them. Uh, and uh, he had convinced them to compromise the truth. Now, Satan seems to have two main tactics, and he has a, a very strong demonic um, organization uh, that is under a demonic kingdom, if you will, this underneath his command. Um, and in some places, he presents himself to have more power than he really has. In other places, he is more subtle and convinces people that he doesn't exist at all. Uh, and those are two ways that Satan seeks to intimidate and to tempt and to destroy our faith and our Christian testimony. Well, he says, you have been tempted. Uh, and Satan is a deceiver. He, he paints the truth as he colors it with half-truth. He puts some ideas in. He says, okay, well, you can believe this, but also you should believe this also. 
uh, you should insert this, insert that. And that's one of the ways he tempts us and deceives us. Now, he mentions uh, three areas of compromise in verse 14. That is Revelation 2, 14. He says, first of all, you eat things sacrificed to idols. And that's a reference to adopting pagan beliefs. One of the ideas of pagan um, pagan theology or pagan I, pagan doctrinal ideas or concepts is the idea that physical things will do you some spiritual good. Uh, it's a superstitious idea that uh, this thing I hold or this ritual I do will actually do me some spiritual good. And this is a deception. Jesus said that the, that the flesh counts for nothing, that we have a spiritual world in which we live in him and the truth comes into our lives. We believe in him, we receive the spirit. But he's saying that you ha they had compromised the scripture. They had compromised their beliefs. They brought in non-Christian ideas and they, they put them into the fabric of their faith. Secondly, it said that they had committed sexual immorality and that's a reference to adopted adopting pagan morality or pagan immorality, uh, especially in the area of sexual habits. And they just went along with what the world said. And thirdly, they had tolerated those who had held to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. We looked at the Nicolaitans uh, the last couple of weeks. Actually, Nicolaitan literally means people controllers. And you see, when they lost the gospel, when they put aside the gospel, and they began to compromise teaching and preaching, and they began to insert rituals and say the ritual will save you, and neglected faith, and 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 the pastor uh, was neglected, the priest came forth. When those things happened, then they had to find some way to control people. So they brought out this whole idea, rather than letting the truth of God and the Spirit of God change people and build them up and free them and by the power of God control them in the sense of giving them life and a new, a new nature. They began to make threats. If you don't do this, you'll go to hell uh, or you go to stay long in purgatory and began to create a whole made up theology that was simply meant to control people. Uh, the pastor was replaced by the priest. The pastor preached the truth and freed people. The priest said, no, no, you've got to come to me. You can't pray to stick to Jesus. You have to come to me and I'll, I'll pray for you. And so all this system, the people controllers was what happened to the church in these years. And at the end of this period, it was a very different church that we see in the New Testament. Doctrinal compromise led to moral compromise. Now, what was the solution? Repentance. That's the solution. The solution is not to say, well, let's see if we can find some way to maintain this compromise. No. Jesus said, you need to repent. And if you have neglected the word of God, or if you have started to become a superstitious Christian, and you put more credit into little amulets or a necklace or a St. Christopher that you may wear that you think is blessed by a priest or a statue of Mary that's been blessed by blessed by a priest in your home. If you put more power and trust in these things or a crucifix that you wear around your neck, you think it's going to ward off the demons or the vampires or whatever. If you put more trust in that than Christ, then you're deceived. Several years ago, I was on a plane coming from Davao City, Philippines to Manila. And I, I got on the plane and I remember I had a very bad head cold. And so I I didn't really feel like sharing the faith, but I was going to share usually with my seatmate if I could get in a word about Christ. But it was a young lady sat down next to me, and just as the plane began to taxi down the runway, she got her Bible and held it in her lap, and I thought, oh, well, she's got a Bible. She must be a believer. And so I thought, well, I don't have to get my germs over on her by sharing my faith, so I just let her be, and she let me be. And she held on her Bible tightly the whole trip. It was about a two-hour flight. And as we landed in Manila, then she put her Bible away. And what she was really doing is using the Bible as some type of safety that maybe it would keep the plane up. And she wasn't reading it, unfortunately. She was just holding on to it. And that's the way some people are. They think, it, my Bible's going to bring me luck. No, the Bible is to be used when you open it up and read it and let God change your heart and your life. That's just one of the ways we are 
compromise. It mentions this, this curious Old Testament character, um, Balaam. And uh, you can read in the Old Testament about Balaam. Uh, but it, it simply depicts uh, him as the one who influenced the King Balak to, to, to convince the, the, the nation of Israel to intermarry with the Moabite people and the other, the other Canaanite people. And that really led to moral compromise as well as doctrinal compromise. Uh, and we have to realize Christ calls us to be different from the world. Uh, we're not to seek to please the world or we're not to seek to be popular with the world or for the world to say you're doing a good job. Our only goal should be to please Christ with our life, with our testimony, with our church. Now, if we will be friendly to the world and we will reach out in love to the world, we should expect the world to recognize that. Uh, but our goal is not to please them. Our goal is to please Christ. And, and as we please him, we're going to love a world and, and reach out to them in his name. But we can never compromise with the world. We can never mix the world's beliefs with Christian beliefs. So how do we overcome? The promise the one who overcomes is the one who repents and goes back to the word of God and doesn't get caught up in all the superstitions or the false teachings, but is able to weed those things out and get rid of them and come back to the word of God, not to go beyond the word of God, uh, but to come back and be faithful to the word of God. The word of God is what we are to, to trust and what we are to believe. What well, he promised that they would have the hidden manna, and that simply means true spiritual nourishment of the soul. Uh, that is, Christ is going to feed us with his truth. He is going to free us from our chains uh, in the world. He's going to really change us. It's, the, it, it's hidden from an unbelieving world. It's Although it's there in black and white, uh, the truth is hidden from them because of their lack of faith. When we read the Bible, we read it very differently because we see it as God's message to us and it has an effect on our life, a powerful effect on our life because we embrace it with faith. Now, it speaks about a white stone with a new name written on it. And here's uh, one, one symbol in the book of Revelation that scholars say we think we've lost what that means. But, but probably the most likely meaning of that was simply it was used as a ticket to get into uh, a show, get into some type of like a drama or maybe a sporting event. Uh, and that's the probably the best idea, but it means entrance. If that's the case, it means entrance into eternity in Christ. It means coming in to God's kingdom. Uh, but what a wonderful promise that is. And then he says, a new name which no one knows except him who receives it. That's a reference to the assurance of salvation. It's the new nature we have in Christ. The new name is being a child of God. And God's spirit bears witness with our spirit through the word, but bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Well, that's a wonderful testimony about what God can do. But are you hungry for the word of God? You have so many ideas around you today. We do have so many ideas and we have so many forms of entertainment, so many books to read. Uh, but our hearts really long for the pure word of God. 1942, the German army was cut off in Stalingrad uh, in that terrible battle for Stalingrad, which they lost. Uh, and uh, you know the story historically, Hitler refused to pull back uh, and he left the troops there and they were surrounded and, uh, and cut off and eventually they were defeated and taken, taken prisoner. Well, uh, they were still communicating with the with the, um, uh, the government back in the military headquarters back in Germany. And one of the last requests they made is, please send more Bibles. Our soldiers are dying. And they had Mein Kampf. They had Hitler's, uh, Hitler's Bible, or Hitler's writing, My Struggle. But what their hearts longed for was the word of God. When it came time to die, they said, we need something with more power than this. We need the word of God. So they did. They brought more Bibles for the soldiers to take and read in those final days of defeat. Well, it's not just a book to die by. It's also a book to live by. And that's what we're to have. So in your life, have you committed to the word of God? That's how you become a Christian, by reading the gospel and believing 
believing in Christ, turning from your sin and turning to trust in him. It's also how we grow as a Christian. That's how he sets us free. That's how also he unites Christians together to take the word of God seriously and read it, study it, share it, live it, memorize it, meditate on it, hold on to it. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your grace and your love. We are nothing without you, but through you, we can do all things. We thank you for your word that liberates us from sin, uh, that opens our eyes to understand the wonderful salvation you've given to us. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen our faith in you, mature us. And Lord, I pray for International Baptist Church in Stuttgart. I pray, Lord, that uh, as long as this church exists, until you return, that as long as this church exists, that it would remain true to your word, that we would have a strong commitment to teach, preach, and to live your word. We thank you, Lord, for your grace to us. I pray for everyone who's studying this, who's studying this uh, series and who's listening to this video, that you would bless them. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, friend. May God bless you today.